So today is Pentecost Sunday. I think you know that now, don't you? Yeah. 50, 50 days after Jesus shared his last meal with his friends in the upper room, the Passover meal. This is the day of Pentecost. And uh, this is what happened in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Well, this is an historic event that changed the world forever. Of course, there's a number of events, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. But this is also one of those events that uh, changed the trajectory of world history forever. And the outworking of this event, which we just read about, was the conversion of 3,000 people all at once. Imagine 3,000 people repenting and being baptized. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, those who accepted his message, Peter was preaching, were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The church in earnest was born at that moment. Now with the event, there was the sound like that of a rushing mighty wind. What does that sound like? sign of fire over a person's head. And people speaking to other people in languages that those other people knew, but the speakers didn't know. It's what made this day of Pentecost epic, unusual, supernatural, intriguing. There were phenomenal signs that marked this event. Now Jesus himself, though not present physically, because he had already ascended to the right hand of the Father, he alluded to this occasion on many occasions. He spoke of something else coming after his departure. He said in John 16, 7, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus is saying, I must leave, so another must come. John 14, 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So we learn that on this day, this day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And the reason that the Holy Spirit came was to make persons like you or I aware of Jesus to advocate, to point, to reveal Jesus to us, to teach us, and to empower us to share our faith. How many of you are timid in sharing your faith? Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, right to the extent, the furthest ends of the earth. Peter, the one or one of the people being affected by the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost. This is the same Peter that denied Jesus three times. Now stands up and preaches an epic sermon and 3,000 people respond. We need to understand who or what this Holy Spirit is. Is the Holy Spirit a force? A force. Like Star Wars. May the force be with you, Luke. Is that what we're talking about when we're talking about the Holy Spirit? Some people use the term dynamic energy. Is the Holy Spirit a cosmic pulse that emanates to and through everything, upon and around, and we need to align ourselves with God to tap in to that energy? If you, if you refer to Luke chapter 1, verse 35, Mary is, is told that the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will, will you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on so you. So you might realize that there's this, 
There's this association, there's this connection with divine power and the Holy Spirit. And so, is the Holy Spirit just an energy, an invisible force that emanates from God? Do you know Zen Buddhists, that's what they believe? Just an energy, just an invisible force. Jehovah's Witnesses too. That's their variation of the scriptures. You see, if you say that the Holy Spirit is just a force, just something like a power that surges, you have to ignore a whole spectrum of other scripture about the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we're not to grieve the Spirit of God with whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, is it possible to grieve a force? In my experience, you can only grieve a person. A person has an emotional response to loss and therefore grieves. It's a person that is grieved. Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as a him, a personal term. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And so according to scripture, the Holy Spirit is not just a vague, ethereal shadow or an impersonal force. Holy Spirit is a person. The third person of the Trinity. Hold it, Pastor. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. No, it's not. But the Trinity is taught. Because we're taught that God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we see the Holy Spirit being spoken of as a person. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as an advocate or a helper. And the Greek word is paraclete. It means literally that which comes alongside. One that is alongside. Now Greek soldiers, when they went into battle, their partner, their battle buddy, was said to be their paraclete. The one who was by their side, the one who had their back. The one who, who compensated for their blind spot. That was their paraclete, the one alongside them. And so Jesus is teaching us that the Holy Spirit is our battle partner, our paraclete, the one who is beside us for all the battle engagements we have, all the conflicts we have in life. But more than that, Jesus added, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus said, I will come to you. He's telling us that the Holy Spirit is God with us now. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the end. Holy Spirit is God with us now. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, Ananias lies to the Holy Spirit and is, is consequenced, and here is, the, here is the reasoning, because he lied to God. The Holy Spirit is associated with God. And though no one truly understands the dynamics or the inner workings of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is included in the Godhead. We're to be baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here we are. We're commemorating the day of Pentecost. Jesus is ascended to heaven. God is arriving with phenomenal power. He's baptizing, which means he's immersing, he's drenching persons in himself through the person of the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, he's given them dynamite, a power, so that they can be bold and stand up with, with courage and tell others about their relationship with God. All heaven is breaking loose. You've heard the term, all hell breaks loose? Right now we see all heaven breaking loose. And the church in earnest is born. Now, I want to understand God with us now better. <clears throat> and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is like a dove. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. He is like a dove. It's a symbol. Matthew chapter 3 indicates that when Jesus came out of the baptismal waters, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. What is it that he and others saw? We really don't know literally. We see that the Holy Spirit is descending like a dove. The appearance is something graceful and gentle because doves are not aggressive. Have you ever met an aggressive dove? I'm, be for obvious reasons, I'm watching birds these days. 
And, and you ever heard the term bird brain? What a bird brain? Well, I think I understand what bird brain means now. I have a couple birds that see the reflection on my window, and they've determined to kill themselves, thinking that their own reflection is an enemy or someone who's challenging for territory. And they're trying to get in the house, and they knock themselves out doing it. That's a bird brain, okay? But I don't see doves doing that. Doves are not aggressive. They're gentle. A dove is easily shooed away. Get. And it goes, which kind of also makes sense when, we, when we're told that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is easily, but will not force himself upon you. Now, all species of doves make a whirling sound when they, when they fly. Remember? Right? And, and they make this sound with their wings, and, and they come in for a landing with their wings open wide. I wonder what it is that they saw when the Spirit descended like a dove on Jesus. I know one thing for sure. Whatever they saw, there was a gentleness and a gracefulness. Nothing aggressive. Doves are considered harmless. Didn't Jesus send his disciples out to be as wise as serpents as as harmless as doves? Does a dove ever hurt you? Well, my mom used to say, Actually, dove has hurt me, now that I think about it. Little birdie in the sky, dropping white watch in my eye. I don't worry, I don't cry. I thank God the cows don't fly. Oh. <laughs> but that's the worst of it, right? Doves are harmless. Oh, it's insane the things that your brain holds. <laughs> and just comes out. Now a pigeon, now a dove is part of the pigeon family, but they're, they're also differentiated in many ways. A pigeon just lands anywhere, but a dove isn't migratory. It always returns to its home. And think of that when you understand that we're the temples of the Holy Spirit. We become the home. A dove always knows where home is. There was a Norwegian explorer, his name was... Roald Amundsen, and he was the first to discover the magnetic meridian of the North Pole and to discover the South Pole. Now, on one of his trips, he took a dove with him, um, and when he had finally reached the top of the world, he had released it, and you know what the dove did? Flew all the way back to Norway, and as soon as the dove arrived at home, where his wife was, she looked out and saw the dove, and she knew, my husband is alive. The Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. And now it's not just the 12 disciples who know, or the 11 at this point, who know that Jesus is alive. But now everybody knows that Jesus is alive. It's amazing what you can learn when you compare the Holy Spirit to a dove. It gives us tremendous insight as to the nature of God with us in the here and now. Now, Jesus also compared the Holy Spirit to water. John chapter 7, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, Jesus is referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit, but comparing the Holy Spirit to water. Now, is water necessary to human life? What does that mean for the follower of Jesus, if the Holy Spirit is like water? And water, if encountered at the right temperature and purity, it's absolutely the most refreshing and cleansing thing. And living water, Jesus is speaking about, is just that. It's not water that sits and becomes stagnant. Living water is, is moving. It's bubbling water. And so the Holy Spirit, God with us now, is cleansing, refreshing, invigorating, life-giving. And as we receive Him, He flows from us. Don't think of the Thames River. Don't think of polluted rivers or acid rain lakes. But think of a pristine northern Alberta lake and melting glacial ice from mountains flowing down. Think of, think of waters that, that converge into the Niagara and then flow over Niagara Falls. In the last days, Peter preached, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
If you go to the bottom of the falls, and to the shoreline and you enter the water, at first you're up to your ankles. But if you keep going out, you'll be up to your knees. Eventually, as you go deeper and deeper, well, you can be completely immersed. Some people say there are churches that aren't really spirit churches. But we need to be careful about that because you don't have to be very deep to be in the spirit. But those of us who want to experience the fullness of God and to know God in His fullness <coughs> want to go deeper. There's a classic French film. It's entitled Jean de Forêt. Jean inherits a farm. But the people really don't want Jean. They want him to forsake the farm so that they can, they can take it over. And so they have this plot where they, they, they cut off the water supply to Jean's farm. He doesn't know that there's a little stream that feeds his farm. And so they, they, they cut it off and, and with a tremendous amount of dirt. And because it doesn't rain very often there, he's forced to go well over a mile to fetch water and to do back-breaking work to bring the water to his farm to irrigate as much as possible. Well, you know that that's not going to work in the long term. He eventually gets so discouraged. And he never discovers that he already has an inexhaustible supply of water underground nearby. And how many of us live our Christian lives like that? We're completely unaware of the Holy Spirit living within us, and we spend our lives in backbreaking effort to try to haul in another supply to satisfy us to give us life when it's there all along. You know, the Holy Spirit is also compared to wind. The Holy Spirit is not wind, but it is like wind. This is why I suspect on the day of Pentecost there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. John 3, Nicodemus comes to see Jesus at night. It's the first experience of Nick at night, which is, some of you will know what that is. The wind blows, he says, wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, the wind is not something we typically see, is it? Except in rare occurrences. But the wind is something we experience, like the breeze on our, our face, or we observe its effects, like the rustling of leaves in a tree, or the, the turning of the turbines on those <coughs> beloved windmill things in my backyard that aren't supposed to make a noise, but at night you hear, whoom, 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 but that's just me. You see, you don't see the Holy Spirit, but you feel the effects, you observe the effects. The Holy Spirit is like that. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which means breath. The Greek word is pneuma, from which we get our word pneumatic, or pneumonia, having to do with airflow. The Spirit breathed into man and he became a living being. And so we see there's an association between the wind and breath and the Spirit. And both wind and water can be used to generate electrical power. And so Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, you will receive power to witness. There's so much we can learn with these comparisons. Wind can be revealing too. If you have a piece of siding on your house that hasn't been tacked on properly, the wind will show you that it wasn't fastened properly. If there's a, a weak limb in your tree, the wind will tell you that it wasn't strong. And if there's garbage in the neighborhood, the wind has a way of clustering it all up and sticking it in a corner where you don't want it. The Holy Spirit reveals truth in our lives so that it can be cleaned up, so that we can be strengthened and restored. The Holy Spirit in Scripture is also compared to fire. On the day of Pentecost, not only was there the sound of a rushing mighty wind, but there was something said to be like fire above everybody's heads. I know that Jesus or John the Baptist referred to Jesus as, as carrying a kind of a sickle and, and, and take, burning up the chaff. The Holy Spirit would come in fire. Fire 
is a, a wonderful thing. Because of it, we can see light, we cook with it, we get warmth from it, we melt metals, we temper steel, we make glass clear. But more than that, fire cleanses and it purifies. It, it, re it removes impurities when applied properly. And all of this relates to the nature, the character, and the function of what Holy Spirit intends to do in our lives now. For He is God with us now. But unfortunately, fire can be snuffed out, right? Paul taught that we should not quench the Holy Spirit. So as followers of Jesus, we are forgiven, but we're also in formation. God is trying to make us ready so that we will fit in His presence for eternity. And so, Holy Spirit is trying to develop character, the fruit of the Spirit in you, by cleansing the junk, revealing what's there, so it can be taken away. There's a lot of argument and debate as to what is the evidence, how do you know that you are filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, as we are told in Acts chapter 2. And some people <laughs> say it's this overflowing sense of love, other people say you speak in another language. All of those might be true, but one of the definite signs of the Holy Spirit in your life is trouble. That's the initial sign, trouble. Because God wants to clean you up. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. And through the trials and the tribulations, God is working in your life to make you ready for eternity. I have a 10-year-old in my house, Maggie, and I think she's like most 10-year-olds. I ask her to clean up her room. Tell her what to do. She goes in there. She comes back 30 seconds later. I'm done. You can't have cleaned up your room in 30 seconds. You are not done. No, I'm done. Have you cleaned up this? Have you cleaned up that? Yes. Have you picked up your beanie boos? Yes. I go into the room. There's 50 beanie boos or whatever it is right there on the floor. Oh, I didn't see them. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't see them? They're right there. Well, I didn't see them. Reminds me of Jesus' words when he talks about his Holy Spirit. It says, we will make our house with you. I find the Holy Spirit likes to take us around the, the inner space of our lives where the temples of the Holy Spirit and says, look it. You see where you, uh, you left a mess there? You see the pile of the floor in that room of your life? You notice in this corner, it stinks. I'm here to help you clean up your life, to get you ready. The Holy Spirit is like oil. In ancient times, olive oil was used to anoint priests and kings, to consecrate them to their positions of authority and influence. Even pieces of furniture, if you wanted to put them in the temple or to use them for God's service, you anointed them with oil to consecrate them so they'd be set aside for the glory of God. The word was called anointing. Jesus is called Messiah, Messiah, which means the anointed one. And, there's, and he who is he's anointed by the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. God has anointed me to preach good news. And so there's this parallel, there's this... Similarity between oil and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to consecrate us, to set us apart, so that we can not only serve Him, but be empowered and enabled to serve the Lord. 1 John 2.20, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. Did you know that God wants to anoint you? All of these similes, all of these metaphors are given to help us understand God with us now in the person of the Holy Spirit. A dove, water, wind, fire. And he anoints some people with languages that they've never learned so that they can share the gospel with people in their own tongue. Back in 2013, you are all going to remember this, February 10th, watching the TV. How many of you have ever gone on a cruise? Oh, we have a few travel agents here, I think, too. Yeah. We're going to cruise Carnival. 
they, this is what um, CNN called the, uh, the cruise from hell. You remember what happened? The fire broke out in the engine room and the entire ship lost power. You know what happened to that ship while it lost power? It was a disaster. It drifted in, in the Gulf of Mexico with the currents. 4,200 passengers and crews were left in, in limbo. They couldn't flush the toilets. 4,200 people couldn't flush the toilets. I can't imagine. Is it any wonder why they wouldn't sleep in their rooms? Because they started to overflow as well into the rooms. All the food, the perishable food, began to rot and to stink. Everything went rancid. The conclusion is, when the power goes out, party's over. We desperately need God with us now in the person of the Holy Spirit. Let us not grieve. Let us not stuff out God's presence in our hands. Heavenly Father, this day of Pentecost, we're reminded of what happened on that first day when you came in power upon those that were waiting in the upper, upper room to understand and to anticipate what you meant when you said that you would send another. They would receive power. And they would become witnesses. And then it happened with all sorts of phenomena. But now you are with us. Right until the end of the days. In these last days you will pour out your spirit. So we know we are living in the days of your spirit being poured out upon us. But Niagara Falls it just doesn't stop. There's so much what we need to stand under the refreshing water. God, open our hearts to the fullness of what you have for us. And may we live in the reality that you are with us now. And you are gentle, and yet you are powerful. And you've come to improve our lives and to make us into the people you want us to be. And everyone said, thank you, God.